I'd like to welcome our guest speaker today, Vince Michael. Uh, Vince, until very recently, was the executive director of the Global Heritage Fund, which is based out of um, California, Palo Alto, is that right? Um, and uh, he'll tell you a little bit more about that organization and the work that they're doing in terms of uh, preserving and conserving important heritage sites throughout the world. Uh, Vince was also the uh, director of the uh, Historic Preservation Program at the Art Institute of Chicago. And he also had worked, uh, he's also a national trustee for the Trust uh, for um, Historic, well, Trust for Historic Preservation, no, National, Trust. National, National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, so um, he's going to give a little talk about uh, what they do there, but I also had to ask him to uh, give us his thoughts about Washington, D.C. as a heritage site. Uh, obviously, we're a very young country, and this space is just a century, a little over a century old uh, in terms of the mall and, a little, and what we're doing in the Lafont City, uh, but I also think uh, in the long term, we should think about uh, the importance of what we do and what our contributions um, as as that part of as that part of the city develops. So I think it's kind of a very we should have a thoughtful discussion about what that means. As part of this presentation, I actually met Vince when was it thirty years ago? 30 years. We were. Yeah, I was an intern. Yes, I was an intern. I was a proto. We were proto millennials yeah. at that <laughs> at that point. Uh, yeah, proto, we were proto of millennials. Um, so uh, we had worked out the same office, and Vince was actually instrumental at that time in um, getting the uh, National Park Service um, the first was a historic court, heritage area, heritage area uh, with the Illinois and Michigan uh, Heritage Corridor. So, and he did a lot of the research, which led to that designation. I believe uh, Ronald Reagan actually signed that into law. Um, yeah, I actually, I actually had a uh, security clearance in August of '84 to be in the same room with re Ronald Reagan. I didn't know that. <laughs> we also had typewriters and a giant wag word processor back then. Remember oh that? yeah, yeah. Remember that? Anyway, um, so I'll leave it up to Vince and uh, to make his presentation. Hopefully, we could have a great pre uh, discussion after this. Great, great. And Marcel, I figured maybe I'll talk for about half an hour and then we can have a discussion. Does that sound good? Great. So um, I'm going to do, I've got two little PowerPoints. One is about what World Heritage Sites are, and I would encourage you, as Marcel said, to think about, you know, um, what you're doing as, you know, part of an important possible future heritage site. Uh, World Heritage Status was created by UNESCO. It is still created by UNESCO. It was started back in the 60s, really uh, 1972, but the idea was to mark sites important to the heritage of the world. And you hear, you may have heard last June, um, they meet once a year and, and uh, inscribe, they don't designate, they inscribe new sites. And the basic criteria is outstanding universal value, which is a pretty vague criteria, like you might find in some sort of local landmarks law. And it includes both man-made and natural cultural treasures. So um, they, in fact, have three categories, um, cultural, natural, and mixed. So you'll have things, uh, a classic example of something that's sort of mixed would be the Bikini Atoll, right? Because it's natural, but we also blew up the first hydrogen bomb there. Um, the United States, for all of its uh, cultural peculiarities, has not used the World Heritage Status a lot in recent years, partly because we don't pay our dues to the UNESCO, uh, but also partly because we think of ourselves as a young place. And we tended to approach World Heritage Status the same way we approached our first landmark law, which was the 1906 Antiquities Act. So we only use it for really, really old stuff. So on, what you're seeing on the lower right is Monk's Mound, which is the largest pyramid in the continental United States, built about the year 1000 by Mississippian Indians, about 10 miles from St. Louis. So that is a World Heritage Site. It's the only one in, in the state of Illinois. Um, we tend to think more of sites like Angkor Wat as World Heritage Sites, which is indeed true, and Angkor Wat was listed in the 1990s, which will lead to an issue that I'll talk about in a minute, which is that a lot of the sites in the developing parts of the world were listed as World Heritage in the hopes of attracting tourism and economic development to places. And sometimes, as in the case of Angkor Wat, they went too far. Um, this is actually one of my favorite World Heritage Sites. I'm showing you a map, a globe, that's at this World Heritage Site. This is the site of Falun in Sweden, uh, which uh, the only time I went to Sweden, everyone says, well, you have to see Falun. Falun is an open pit mine. 
So it's a ben essentially a big scrape in the landscape, which has been uh, there for 300 years. And it's a World Heritage Site, because they have mined all sorts of things there for so many years. In fact, the people in the nearby town uh, in the 19th century used to live longer than anybody else in Sweden, because there were so many uh, heavy metals in the water, it would kill all the bacteria that normally killed you, like cholera and typhoid. We think of natural sites, Halong Bay in Vietnam. There's the World Heritage logo, or at least half of it, um, which you can see around the world when you find a World Heritage site. It has that World Heritage logo. What happens is the politics of it are like this, is that each country, what they're called states parties, will nominate sites to be World Heritage. And they usually first put them on what's called the tentative list. So if you look up on the World Heritage website, it'll show you each country, it'll show you what's inscribed. And then it'll show you what's on the tentative list. So there is sort of a political um, intro, you know, within each national government um, issue on what gets nominated all the way. Here's another site. Um, many of the sites focus on earliest history. So here's a World Heritage site, Hallstatt in Austria, which uh, if you've uh, studied any, you know, early uh, Iron Age culture, Hallstatt is one of those um, cultural markers. It's sort of like, you know, the Hallstatt people. It's like the... Uh, Clovis points and things like that. So uh, there was a tendency for countries, certainly in the beginning, to use it for the earliest types of heritage or for natural heritage, which is seen as older too, whether or not it is. This is, of course, Newgrange, a 5,000-year-old site uh, not far from Dublin in the Boyne Valley of Ireland. This has changed over time. People have started to use world heritage status um, as a way to drive tourism. Angkor Wat was a classic example. And it brings uh, up a point I think is important to a group like this because um, the planning dimension. In order to move from the tentative list to actually be inscribed as a World Heritage Site, you need a management plan. How are you going to manage the World Heritage Site? Um, and there needs to be both you know, a process of the plan, how you're going to take care of the properties, et cetera. Um, and there also needs to be an entity that does that. Now, the challenge with Angkor Wat is that everyone in the world knew it was such a wonderful uh, collection. I, I should say it's not just Angkor Wat. It's Angkor, which is you know hundreds of temple sites, Angkor Wat being the most famous, um, uh, built by Sur Suryavarman II in the 1300s. Uh, but it also includes the Bayon, the famous um, Praia Khan that you see on the upper left. Uh, the Bayon has some of the. Uh, bar reliefs you see on the lower right uh, from the 1400s. So it's actually a complex of sites. And there was a management plan done. And to be quite honest, it has not been followed. Angkor Wat is a good example of sort of the over-commercialization of a World Heritage Site. And I actually participated in the United States ICOMOS Conference in 2007 that was held in San Francisco that talked about sort of the failures of some of these World Heritage Sites for people to actually follow the management plan um, for people to regulate tourism, to create buffer zones so that you don't have tons of uh, hotels uh, creeping right up on the monuments like you do in some of these places. Um, World Heritage Sites can also be more than a single monument. I mentioned Anchor is actually a complex. Well, the Wachau in Austria is actually about 40 miles of the Danube River and includes the vineyards where they grow Grünerfeldliner. When you're, next time you're out at a restaurant, see if you can get Grünerfeldliner. It's a very interesting white wine. 75% of the Wachau is covered with it, but it's very hard to find in the US. Also includes, as you can see, a bunch of beautiful uh, Baroque monasteries, like uh, Melk Abbey on the lower left, uh, the city of Krem, uh, cities of Kremsenstein on the lower right, and uh, Dornstein on the upper left. Um, so this is actually a whole cultural landscape. It includes a huge area. Um, we tend to think of individual sites, but even individual sites can be complexes. Here's another one, La the Lavro in Kiev, which is uh, one of the oldest monastery complexes. It includes a variety of individual uh, churches as well as uh, monastic residences and burial sites. Another one in Ukraine um, is the city of Lviv, which um, is sort of uh, beautiful medieval uh, ren renaissance, really, city, the historic city center. And in fact, World Heritage has been used a lot for historic city centers. So it's something to think about. 
Uh, I'm going to come to a slide in a minute about Peru, which has several of its historic city centers have been listed as World Heritage Sites. And in that case, the management plan is done through some sort of municipal agency. Often we think of temple sites. Uh, Nara in Japan, the Great Temple at Nara, the largest wooden structure in the world, is of course a World Heritage Site. That doesn't mean that these sites, I should point out, um, don't change. I mean, the temple itself has been rebuilt many times because it is wood. Uh, but the question, as in all questions of historic preservation or heritage management, is not whether you're going to change something or not. It's how you're going to change it and what is your process for approving and effecting that change. Um, some World Heritage Sites from India that date from the very ancient, like the Ellora and Ajanta Caves, which date from the second century BC up until about the ninth and 10th century. I always have to point out one of my favorite buildings in the world is this one on the upper left, um, and that's uh, Cave 16 Kailasha at Ellora. This is a full-scale Indian temple. You're seeing the top of it on the left, and then you're seeing it from ground level on the right. That, w that is an inverse building. It was carved out of the side of the mountain from the top down. It has twice the footprint of the Parthenon. It was completely carved as a single sculpture out of the side of the mountain. Um, really amazing. And of course, the Taj Mahal, Fatapur Sikri. India, as you can imagine, has many temples. The temples of Kajaraho, um, Tanjore, the famous uh, Brihidishvara temple from 1010 AD. And of course, the temples of the Mughals, like the Kutab Minar and the Fort at Agra, uh, and the Mahabalapura monuments. Interestingly, last year, I was very uh, pleased because last year they inscribed in India the first um, uh, step well. Last summer they inscribed Rani Kavav. Step wells are a very unique uh, architectural form in India which um, can be found in every community. Little tiny towns would have step wells and they were essentially a way to keep water, especially in the desert states of Rajasthan and Gujarat. Um, you, you'd essentially dig down until you found the groundwater and you'd also collect rainwater there and be be a sort of a community place where everyone would go and get water and it would uh, help store the water and save it. And some places these became quite elaborate, architecturally detailed religious complexes. And one of the most amazing was the Queen Step Well outside of Ahmedabad. Um, and you can see the uh, laser scan of it, right? It's essentially a five story building underground with incredible ornamentation. It's actually dry now. The country with the most World Heritage Sites is, as you might guess, Italy, which includes many urban centers, Rome, Florence, Vicenza, Siena, Naples, Venice, Ferrar, Urbino, and the Baroque towns of Sicily, as well as great monuments like the Duomo, uh, Piazza Navona, the Colosseum, and so forth. And the Italian list obviously includes you know, ancient Roman ruins, archaeological sites, Renaissance and Baroque churches and sites. There's the Villa d'Est on the lower right, uh, Hadrian's Villa on the left. And of course, uh, places like Venice, St. Peter's, and Pisa. Uh, Thailand, the historic ancient capitals, which are archaeological sites. And there tends to be this association of World Heritage with archaeological sites. But I'm sort of more interested in the living cities that are World Heritage sites. And a classic case for that is Peru. Peru is fascinating. Um, in my in involvement with Global Heritage Fund over the last three years, you, know, you get to know certain places. And you realize that Peru is, one of the, is an archaeological archaeologically rich place, uh, not just because of the Inca, because the Inca, like the Aztecs, were a really recent, only 200-year dynasty, but the earlier ones, the Huari and the Moche. Um, Peru has more archaeological sites than all the rest of South America by a landslide. But most of its world heritage sites are, in fact, urban centers. Um, Lima, the center of Lima on the lower right. Uh, on the upper left, Cusco, Trujillo, Arequipa. These are all World Heritage Sites. And I actually did work with students in 2012 in Lima, in the, in the center of Lima. It's called the Cercado because it's uh, where the old city wall was. And it's a huge site. It actually includes the, the sort of main downtown plaza that you see here, but also this huge neighborhood called Barrios Altos that you shouldn't walk in alone. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we, we, you know, we talked to the people responsible for the management plan, which was probably passed in 1994 or something like that. Uh, and it's a big challenge. 
at the same time, a lot of the significant sites, this is the famous Huaca de la Luna uh, archaeological site, you can see those larger than life scale figures on this huge uh, pyramid complex that had been restored uh, thanks to World Monuments Fund and American Express outside of Trujillo. Uh, a lot of their archaeological sites are not inscribed. Um, thinking again about the urban planning you are doing, the L'Enfant plan, the Burnham plan, the mall, and things like that, um, in, in the UK, both the new and old towns of Edinburgh are World Heritage Sites, the new town being one of the famous of the sort of that, that sort of whole uh, enlightenment generation of planning uh, in contrast to the very medieval old town. Another interesting planned community was Saltaire in Yorkshire, which was an inspiration for places like Pullman, uh, the planned community by uh, Sir Titus Salt in Yorkshire. is also World Heritage. Uh, Mexico City, the center, is a World Heritage Site, and of course the great archaeological monuments, the Temples of Sun and Moon in Teotihuacan. So the organization I've worked for for the last three years, and I remain on, on the board and senior advisory board of Global Heritage Fund, uh, was founded, and actually I don't know why there's a typo, we were actually founded in 2002, to focus on World Heritage Sites. So one of the sites we worked in for years uh, that I've been to several times is Pingyao in Shanxi in China. Pingyao is, is uh, one of the old surviving walled cities. So again, from a planning perspective, you actually have an intact city wall. It's not a rebuilt city wall like Xi'an um, or some of these other places. It's actually intact or completely demolished like Beijing's. And it has over 450 traditional courtyard houses, many of which were being destroyed, which is why we got involved. There's also a separate World Heritage Site, and there you see the World Heritage logo again at the Shuanglin Temple outside of Xi'an, about six kilometers away, which is fantastic because it has this huge collection of sculptures which all survived the Cultural Revolution. Um, I could tell you all sorts of interesting stories about how things survived the Cultural Revolution. This particular one, the local magistrate took the buildings that were full of sculpture and loaded grain into them. And when the Red Guards came by, he said, oh, these are granaries. So, But China has its own problems. And when I lectured at the U.S. ECOMOS conference in San Francisco in 2007, I talked about Lijiang. Lijiang was listed as a World Heritage Site in 1997. So at that time, the Chinese officials said, okay, we're a World Heritage Site now. So the first thing we do is we go into the center of town, we kick everybody out, we get rid of any businesses that aren't tourism related, and we create a tourism monoculture, which is similar to you know creating a big field that just grills soybeans. Anything goes wrong with that? no economy. Uh, and uh, Global Heritage Fund actually got involved to try to keep some of the traditional Nashi people and Nashi businesses in the center of Lijiang because it really did go too far in the over-commercialization route. And there is this tendency, you see the World Heritage logo again on the right, in the center of Lijiang. Now the last couple things I'll say about World Heritage before I move to the other slides about Global Heritage Fund is that there's been a distinct movement away from these ancient and archaeological sites, not away from them, but to add on to them and moving into the modern. Uh, and the Europeans have really led this uh, because they can see 20th century buildings that are part of their outstanding universal value, part of their cultural heritage. So if you think uh, Poland, you have the center of Krakow, where you can see uh, St. Mary's Church there on the upper left. Uh, and the Cloth Hall, wonderful uh, late Gothic Cloth Hall on the um, lower left, but also including the 1913 Centennial Hall in Retzlaff by Max Berg, which you can see on the lower right and upper right. And of course, the uh, Bauhaus at Dessau has been included, um, uh, the Schroeder House in Utrecht by Rietveld, and in the Netherlands has been included. And one of the other boards I'm on, um, I think I'm only on three boards right now. Uh, National Trust, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy, and the other one, er, uh, and uh, um, Global Heritage, but Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy is just now nominating a list of 10 Frank Lloyd Wright sites um, to World Heritage, which includes one like the famous Roby House, Falling Water, Union Temple, and the Marin County Courthouse. So uh, that's, that's a brief background on World Heritage, and what I'd like to do to sort of wrap up, and then we can have a discussion. And I'm a Mac person, so I'm not right ready. There. there we go. OK. Um, so what I'd like to do is, is just say a couple words about preservation philosophy and where it's evolved. And this relates both to this moving toward the modern, but also a different understanding 
of uh, how we view heritage throughout the world. Uh, the first international agreement on heritage was Athens in 1931. And the idea was that you wanted to respect all periods. So you wanted places like a city, like your city, to have layers of history and those layers to be visible. But there was also a tendency under the Athens agreement that you could use modern materials to restore things. So people slapped a lot of concrete on stuff, and, you know, and Mussolini put together all these things in Libya that had been falling apart and things, stuff like that. In Venice in 1964, we created basically the modern idea, again, to respect all periods of history, but also the importance of documentation and distinguishing new from old, so people weren't creating false senses of history, which is still an issue in a lot of places. 20 years ago, that really took a, a significant shift, uh, the NARA document on authenticity. Um, and by the way, I'm showing you the um, more than 100-year-old Parthenon from Nashville. <laughs> Has anyone ever seen that? It's a full replica of the Parthenon in Nashville. So I always like having that slide up when you talk about authenticity. Um, but on the lower right, you have the famous Shinto temples at Ise in Japan. Now, the, if you've ever been to the Shinto temples, the Shinto temples are 1,000 years old, except they're torn down every 18 years and rebuilt completely on a different site. But the tools and techniques they're using are 1,000 years old. Whereas we will happily jump into Mount Vernon with nail guns and epoxy, and it won't bother us the least bit. So there are two different approaches. And the NARA document was the first to understand that there were different cultural approaches to authenticity and to the way you treat historic monuments. And it gives us an insight into the importance of cultural diversity, the importance of intangible heritage, the process of doing something as opposed to the artifact. The Western world tends to be focused on the artifact. The Eastern world tends to be a little more appreciative of the process. And that document said authenticity judgments may be linked to a great variety of sources of information, um, including form, but also including the processes. And that really has changed uh, the way we approach uh, conservation in, uh, for me, the most important has been the uh, Borough Charter of 1999, which was originally done in the 70s in Australia, which really said that conservation is an active process of change. It's a reaction to the modernism that was implicit in the Venice Charter. Distinguish the new from the old. Well, what if the new looks older? What if the new style is an old style? Um, and the idea of place and cultural landscape. And really, to me, the most important aspect of the Bird Charter was the idea of community, that you have to engage the culture and the community and say, what is important to you? What elements of your past do you want to bring into the future? And what is the culturally appropriate way to do that? It's not going to be identical everywhere. So it was a move away from a universalizing standard. This is a landmark. This is what it looks like in Athens, and this is what it looks like in Tanzania, and this is what it looks like in in um, uh, Australia or India. Not the case. Uh, Follow-up conventions in the early 2000s in Xi'an and other places also talked about the importance of community engagement and uh, interdisciplinary coordination. So to me, this and th this is something of, of my little rant that I'm always going on, is that, 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 that preservation or heritage conservation, to use the international terminology, is not a set of rules, but a process. Because interestingly, a process can work in sort of a universal way that a community uses to determine what elements of its past it wants in its future. So if you think about preservation as a process, even using the US example, it's a process of identifying what's significant, and you need to engage the community to do that, evaluating that significance against other things, doing some form of registration, whether it's a local landmark status or world heritage status. And then treat it. How do you actually treat that? How do you manage change over time? Because again, there's nothing about keeping things as they were. It's all about managing change over time. So you identify something, whether it's a, a bunch of uh, uh, you know, stones uh, that have fallen apart that need to be put back together through anastylosis, or whether it's landmarks, Beaux Arts, or frankly, right. Then you evaluate, and this is our old uh, Chicago Historic Resources Survey, where you sort of rank the various things, which are more important, which are less important, which are important to convey the character. Uh, and that process of evaluation has to take place within the cultural context. Um, what you see on the right is actually a, a very interesting project in Pingyao. That's a, a Yaodong, which is the rear building 
in the traditional courtyards in that very northern state of Shaanxi. And um, the Yaodong is a sort of a parabolic brick art structure. And we were restoring one courtyard and it had been destroyed in the 70s. And uh, so we built a new one. And so we're like, well, isn't that false history to create a new one? Well, the fact of the matter is people still build Yaodongs there. So the technology wasn't lost. So the line between tradition and modernity hadn't been crossed. Whereas we come up to a Victorian house with parquet floors, I can't go out and buy a new parquet floor now. No one does that anymore. Because we've crossed the line, probably during the Depression World War II, between tradition and modernity. And now we pretty much only have drywall, and we pretty much only have CMUs. So we can't, uh, we can't do that. So that's a good example of how evaluation can be uh, in different places. And then register whatever form of, of, of survey registration to document what's important. And then how you treat it. And that's going to, again, vary from the, the smallest artifacts uh, to the largest, whether that's in the US or on the case in the right in Cambodia. Marcel, I don't know if you ever saw this, but uh, this was a funny one. I was in this building on Wabash Avenue in Chicago, and they landmarked as a historic district all the buildings next to us called Jewelers Row. And then they tore down all but the facades. You've seen this here in Washington, I know, and built an 80-story building behind. Uh, but the fascinating thing for me was as they were tearing down, the facades were all about uh, the oldest piece dated to the 1870s, but mostly they were about 1910. As they tore down the rear, I was looking at the structure on the rear, and I saw the uh, hollow cast iron columns. And I realized the rear of the buildings was actually much older than the front. The front was the newest part. That's the part they saved. And the right, we're doing a mural conservation about a year ago in uh, Yunnan, China. So how you treat something. From a planning perspective, I was involved uh, when I was still in Chicago three years ago with the uh, um, working on the 1937 uh, federally built uh, public housing project, the Lathrop Homes, which was an interesting challenge. You know, do you save everything? What do you save? So I would argue, finally, that preservation is how a community engages with its roots. The community helps determine the significance of the past, how it will be brought into the future. If you approach it this way, you not only deal with different cultures, but within our own culture, you can deal with, uh, you can, can engage the question of diversity. If we look at the National Register in this country, it's like 95%, you know, dead white European males. And to address that, we need to really look at preservation as a process. If you address it as a process, so you can address many threats by engaging all stakeholders in identification, evaluation, and treatments. It encourages appropriate adaptation, so you can modernize, whether it's a traditional Chinese courtyard house, to have facilities that it didn't have historically, like plumbing, electricity. Or you can move a hotel in San Antonio, 10 blocks. And I think the final point I want to make is that it promotes community development. I had the good fortune of getting involved in historic preservation with the first heritage area, the INM Canal National Heritage Corridor which was created in Chicago in 1984. There are more than uh, four dozen of these now in the United States. And it was the first public-private partnership park. This was the Reagan era. It was the age of public-private partnership. It combined preservation with conservation of natural areas, recreational development, and tourism. And the goal was economic development. When we adopted this thing, uh, Marcel, I don't know if you remember, but Joliet had like 23% unemployment in Joliet. And why are you doing a park? You know, the steel mill's closed. Why don't you bring the steel mills back? Well, the steel mills aren't coming back. So what do you do? And uh, the goal was to coordinate interpretation of a regional history. It wasn't specifically regulatory. It was really more partnership. You try to focus resources by creating a singular narrative for a place. Uh, and then I had the good fortune um, 20 years later to get involved with uh, the same idea in China, the Weishan Heritage Valley. Um, and so I, I brought students and we worked on this historic town in Yunnan centered on the Southern Silk Road. We worked on both tangible heritage by um, doing local paving stone for the rebuilding of the Silk Road, traditional carved wooden doors, regulations for height, and all those sort of, sort of nat natural uh, planning and zoning regulations you find in a historic district. But we also worked very significantly on the intangible heritage. How do you keep the traditional noodle makers downtown who hang out their noodles every morning to dry? How do you keep the traditional coffin makers? How do you keep 
those traditional alive as well. And I brought students there starting in 2004. Um, and in every case, I would argue that we were following that process, identification, evaluation, registration, and treatment. Uh, I brought students there in 2006 to document courtyard houses. We did a photo book. I'm skipping through these. Uh, we went back in 2009 and focused on rehabilitating the traditional courtyard houses with modern amenities like plumbing and kitchens. And then back in 2012, uh, we did another reuse plan. So that's how I got involved in Global Heritage Fund, which is the idea was to take world heritage and preserve places that were um, in areas of great need. So places that needed economic development. So we tended to focus on developing countries. That definition's become a little funny because China has more money than anybody else. Is Turkey really a developing country? Uh, Greece isn't a developing country, but it's worked its way back down there pretty well. Um, <laughs> So we're, we've actually had to change it to areas of greatest need. But the idea was that a lot of these countries would designate World Heritage Sites, but they wouldn't have the facilities to do a management plan. So we'd offer planning. Or they could have had a management plan, but they had nothing to save what was being excavated by archaeologists. So we'd offer conservation services. So those, those were our stock and trade, planning, conservation, and then we also tried to partner with local organizations. And community development was always one of our goals. So these, these are the four pieces, conservation science, planning, partnerships, and community development. What you're seeing on the left is a shelter we built over a wonderful classical Maya site in um, uh, Guatemala in the Paten. So we would offer conservation science. At Hampi in India, we worked on the restoration of one of the temples, the Chandra Mulishvar temple in Hampi, which was Vijayanagara, the great last Hindu kingdom of the 15th century in the south. And we did sort of modern documentation and modeling before restoring both the embankment that supported it and the walls itself. At Bante Chamar in Cambodia, we, uh, through Heidelberg University, did 3D scans of the collapsed temple walls so we could figure out how to put them back together. Oops, went wrong way. Um, we do uh, comprehensive planning for each project. Um, what you're seeing on the left is Ciudad Perdida in Colombia. And on the right is Rakigari in India. Um, not just management planning, but also often tourism planning, conservation planning, how are we going to conserve the site over the long term. And we partner with governments, corporations, local and international NGOs, and civic groups. We've uh, partnered with uh, UNESCO, obviously, the Prince Klaus Fund out of the Netherlands, uh, SciArc, which uh, did the scan you saw of Rani Kavav earlier, which is based in Oakland. And partnerships are key, especially local ones, for encouraging stewardship over the long term. Because we would only come in and spend three to five years investing in a site. So who's going to take it on afterwards? You have to have community development. They're the ultimate stewards of the site. So in uh, Pingyao, China, we restored two traditional courtyard houses. We trained local residents and planners. We did a comprehensive city plan, uh, which actually my old friend Phil Enquist from Skidmore Owens and Merrill said it was the best design guidelines he had ever seen which was like high praise. And now we've got the local government has restored 48 more houses. So we did two, launched it, created guidelines, and now they've restored 48 more. In Ciudad Perdida in Colombia, which is a wonderful site, it's a three-day hike um, on, in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta Mountains in the uh, Caribbean coast of Colombia, to these amazing, this is actually a plan, this, place amazes me from a planning perspective. These are these rammed earth platforms that originally would have structures on top, and they're surrounded by stone, and they're collected by, or connected by a profusion of stone walkways. This is high jungle, so it's 95% humidity. It's jungle, but you're in a mountain. So there's no level ground anywhere. It's very wet. The only way to create a frictionless communication for commerce or connection in society is stone staircases. And this civilization, the Tyrona, between 700 and 1400 AD, built hundreds of these collections of sites and then connected them all with these staircases. It's quite fascinating. Uh, so we uh, helped build uh, local homestays and tourism industries. We installed sanitation systems, efficient stoves. We even built a community health center, which is sort of somewhat outside of the purview of a preservation group. But it promoted the community development that will sustain these sites in the long run. I just got back from a trip to our project in the Carpathian villages of Romania. That's the politically correct term. They were the Saxon villages of Romania before, but we can't say that. 
Um, uh, and they were settled by Saxons, or actually Germans from Luxembourg and the Moselle, in the 12th century at the invitation of the King of Hungary. And there are these marvelous little landscapes with these cute little jerkin head roof buildings with their roof tiles. The first thing we did was actually spend uh, about $40,000 creating a traditional kiln to make the roof tiles. And there you see the horse that stirs the clay. And then there's the guy bringing the clay in to be ma made into slabs for the roof tiles that will be fired in the kiln shortly afterwards in Apos. And then we've been doing emergency rehabilitation of houses in the community of Daya. Uh, so that's really been a fascinating project um, that has been very strong in community development and also very strong in cultural landscapes um, because we're trying to preserve the small farm fields and when you go to Transylvania, it really is like a fairy tale. It's, 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 time does feel like it stood still. You don't want it to stand still, but you want to manage it without changing that beautiful aspect. Uh, we've been working at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, which is the world's oldest religious site. It's these uh, stone circles that were carved and then deliver, uh, carved, used in some way, and then deliberately buried by hunters and gatherers uh, 11,000 years ago. These are 5,000 years older than Stonehenge. And they were excavated starting in 1994 by the German Archaeological Institute. As with many archaeological investigations, there was no conservation going on, so we came in and did that piece. And we've employed local Kurds as guards, laborers, and skilled workers. It's interesting because Global Heritage Fund, founded in 2002, finally, in the current decade, everyone has seen cultural heritage as a key to economic development. So UNESCO did the Power of Culture for Development in 2010. ICOMOS uh, the following year did the Paris Declaration on Heritage as a Driver of Development. We now tend to see when we talk about sustainability, not just social, economic, and environmental, but cultural. If you do something against the culture of a place, all the other three aren't going to count. Heritage can only be sustained in the long term if it is part of the economy of a community. And similar to our, our Romanian project is our project in Guizhou, China. Guizhou is the poorest province in China. And I was involved in this meeting in 2012 where we actually engaged the community in preserving both the tangible and intangible heritage. We've got more partners than any other project. UNESCO, two of the major universities, Yo Chung, which is a Chinese NGO that focuses on intangible heritage, and the uh, Guizhou Cultural Heritage Administration. So we're working not just on saving the, the buildings of Guizhou, but also the traditions. One of the villages, they make paper that's used by calligraphers. Um, in uh, the Dali Dong village of the Dong minority, we've started restoring the traditional drum tower this year. So we promote community development because it provides long-term sustainability and stewardship. And a lot of people like to argue with me, even though I've been involved in the economic community development side my whole career, that. Well, that's not real economic development. Real economic development is, you know, building a Foxconn factory or, a, you know, a Nike factory or real economic. I said, well, you know what the problem is? I build a factory or a refinery. I can move it. Am I going to move the Taj Mahal or the Great Wall? No. If I can make a heritage site an economic engine, it's really sustainable. So the crisis continues. We've seen heritage actually in the news this year uh, because it's, it's been deliberately targeted, uh, especially by ISIS in Syria and Iraq. We're actually working on that. We're working on a mobile platform to get information in and out. Um, so it's something that you know, people are recognizing again. You know, m people don't live by bread alone. And uh, heritage really is an important part of rootedness. It's why people invest their time, money, and lives in a place. So uh, I'll just sort of finish up here with this slide that parallels Yunnan and San Antonio. <laughs> when we sustain historic landmarks, we sustain our community, our economy, and our humanity. 